Hi, Sam. Thank you for joining me on the podcast today. Thank you very much for having me. I've been really looking forward to this one. So, uh, so founder of Blue Bricks, or at least owner of Blue Bricks, I should say. And you're very big and sort of well-known in the property space, Sam. I think we are going to have an interesting conversation today about your adventure through property today and where it's all going. What would be great, I think, from our point of view, and, and I'm sure our listeners would love to, love to hear from you on, is what the values of potentially getting featured in things like magazines like Blue Bricks, podcasts, other publications can do for property investors i know firsthand and you know i'm sure i can share some of my experiences today but obviously you're at the other side of this and you know what it is that people who run magazines like blue bricks obviously are, are looking for and you know in investors and things like that, that that you're showcasing but before we get there sam tell us just a little bit about yourself for anyone who perhaps hasn't heard about you or blue bricks tell us a little bit about yourself and what you currently do in the property space please yeah, absolutely. So my name is Sam Cook. Uh, I'm the owner of Blue Bricks Magazine. Uh, the, the reason that I did found Blue Bricks is that I worked for the company uh, before purchasing it in 2022, I think it was, which then made me the owner of the business. Um, so over the past two years, I've been running Blue Bricks Magazine, growing that business, launched the Blue Bricks Property Awards this year as well, which was a huge award ceremony in Chester for 250 people. Um, I know you were a finalist for that and if the commercial conversion deal as well. And then, yeah, that's me in a nutshell, running multiple other events across the UK, got broadly events that we're running, first one being Pigeons in Property, which is the 11th of October, which is Clay Pigeon Shooting and Property Networking. Which, I which I'm going to. Cool. <laughs> yeah, you're going to. You're one of the main speakers there as well. <laughs> Good, well, I'll be no use at shooting, that's for sure. So hopefully <laughs> they can bring some value on the stage, but yeah, I'll be useless with a gun. I'm from Bradford, buddy. I'm going to be hitting them all. <laughs> <laughs> and Sam, you are, you're obviously running the magazine now. Um, yeah. Do you invest in property yourself or is that an interest in yourself? Do you have a particular interest in property or actually is it more so in media publications and that sort of thing? Yes, it's a twofold question really. So number one, yes, I'm doing stuff in property at the moment. I'm looking for properties in the north. I've got a business partner that we can be working with. And we've got our own money we're going to be investing and looking at raising some private finance. That too, I've got quite a broad network of investors. So it's about time I put that to use. Uh, the reason that we're not done it sooner is Blue Bricks was the flip business, which meant when I bought it, it was unprofitable. So all my focus has been on fixing, saving, and growing that. And I invest in other things too, which isn't public knowledge, which will be in the next couple of weeks. So I invest in businesses. So I'm actually in the process of buying two businesses at the moment, which again, those are just sat with the solicitors and hopefully, fingers crossed, this week, um, that will all go through and then we can do a, a bit more about that. Fantastic. So you really are a, an entrepreneur in the property space. Do you enjoy it, Sam? I mean, taking on a business that's not profitable, trying to turn it into a profitable business and everything that goes along with it. You know, I, I've built a number of businesses. I've sold one of my businesses. I know how challenging it can be, but um, in a kind of strange, fairly sadistic way, I, I sort of enjoy it. <laughs> but do you enjoy that? Is it the pursuit and that challenge itself that you enjoy uh, as much as potentially the rewards at the end of it? I, I think it depends on what week you ask me, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, do, do I enjoy it? I, I do. I love it. I love creating, innovating, growing, doing things, bringing people together, like doing the Blue Brick Swords and, and also meeting people like yourself. It really is good fun. Don't get me wrong. There's weeks and days where it's challenging and hard and difficult. And you think, why am I doing this? Uh, you know, 25 days, annual leave, finish at five o'clock. Sounds nice. But I do love what I do and I couldn't picture myself doing anything else. Yeah, it's um, there's huge sacrifice and compromise that you've got to make, and it's yeah. really getting to know you over the last couple of years. You know, it's been great to see you on that journey as well, and see how committed you are. I mean, to organise the event that you did, you know, at the castle, you know, the big award ceremony. You know, we do a little bit of eventing, not much, as you know, most of ours is in the online space. But I also know how much of a challenge and how risky it can be. And I've got to take my hat off to you, Sam, because. You know, putting your money where your mouth is and, and committing, uh, you know, your time, resources, your team, finances to that sort of thing. It says a huge amount of your character and testament. And I was there and it was a great day and obviously lots of people absolutely jam-packed. But it's, you know, it's risky stuff. And obviously you've got the, the sort of temperament that, that you need in business to be able to do this kind of thing. I mean, you're very much on the other side of this from an investor's point. If I put my investor hat on now, you're very much on the other side of this. And I remember the first time I was ever featured in a magazine and it was such an exciting moment for me. I think I'd done a flip. Someone had picked it up. They asked if it could feature it in a magazine. And honestly, that is really where 
things did start to change for me. And today I'd like to maybe get into this question. Is the kind of the byproduct or the washout from that sort of an opportunity? Is it, you know, was for me and, and other people, has it just been fortunate? Or actually, is there logic to it? You know, is actually getting featured and that, is that something that can really enhance one's business and prospects? And I want to talk to you about this in detail today. B- before we get there, though, you've got this, you know, you sit in this really incredible position with, you know, a lot of oversight on the market, what a lot of people are doing in different spaces, different places across the country, different strategies. What are your general thoughts on what you're seeing at the minute in terms of um, the types of investments that are working, things that are not working, the general consensus from investors and landlords? You know, obviously, we read the news, there's this exodus that, you know, for buy to let, but, but actually, uh, you deal with a lot of people who are actually involved. And just interested to get your thoughts on on what you're sort of seeing and feeling in the property market at the minute. Yeah, I, th- I think it's a really interesting time. There's been even more talk, and I know it's been talking for a while about this, but about surface accommodation and potentially there being an article for type piece of legislation that comes in that prohibits certain properties from being made in surface accommodation units, or at the very least, you need planning permission. I know certain councils, I think Blackpool Council, have been doing this, where if you don't have the right planning, have actually requested that the property be turned back into a standard site or a residential property. So I think, I don't want to put people off surface accommodation as a strategy, and, um, but I think that we're going to see some interesting changes and announcements in the coming months in that sector. What I am seeing work quite well is um, HMOs, um, particularly HMOs that range at professionals, more co-living approaches, a bit like what Caroline Paxson does, for example, um, and the guys that be high living, people that are afraid need more kind of like communities inside their properties. I'm seeing that work really well from people and people making some kind of good money from that. Um, I think one thing that is going to become very popular is going to be commercial conversions um, through the use classes. Mm -hmm. It it seems that the government and the councils are really pushing people to be recycling existing properties rather than building from the ground up. Um, We've had BNG, Biodiversity Net Game, uh, come about this year. Yep. which has made it a little bit sticky uh, for yeah. some new build developers. It's also meant that some sites aren't viable anymore. So I think we're also going to see a few new build developers move into the commercial conversion space. Yeah. So that's what I kind of think is going to start happening. Interesting. I agree. It's an interesting time. You know, we don't have a crystal ball. Um, there are some changes afoot, some potentially good, some potentially bad. We've also got the renter's rights bill, which is going to start yes. washing its way through, which is, you know, definitely going to impact all of us who are renting renting properties. I'm sure like, like many things, the, there's op- ways to adapt, ways to actually get ahead of the curve. Talked about some of it on the show before. But um, yeah. interesting to hear you talk about these different different strategies. And obviously great to hear you talk so, you know, positively about HMOs on the HMO podcast. <laughs> I love HMOs. Well, so do we. And, you know, a lot of our listeners, Sam, um, a lot of people I work with, especially those at the earlier stages of their property business, often stifled by the challenges, uh, the difficulty getting into the market or scaling up, usually big limitation is access to finance. Even when we can find the right deal or find a really good deal where we can potentially recycle lots of money out, we can can, can create some really good numbers. It can be prohibitive if we don't have the funds. Um, And for some of us, actually just finding those opportunities or getting access to enough of those opportunities, these are all the sorts of challenges that a lot of people out there, a lot of our listeners are facing with. And like I said, very briefly, I remember getting featured in a magazine for the very first time, probably back in 2015, it's nearly 10 years ago. And I think I'm quite an extreme example of taking the idea of of building my network with the intention to enhance my opportunities, deals, cash, and all that sort of stuff. Obviously now I've got a podcast, you share all sorts of things on various different channels and platforms and publications, and you run a magazine. So let's talk about what it is that you think can be so valuable for people uh, you know and investors you know who are potentially trying to achieve those sorts of things you know what sort of benefits can they actually get from being featured in these sorts of publications then maybe we'll come back around and actually talk about how we can potentially get featured and get people to take interest but tell us first about what the opportunities can actually be from being featured in publications and so on yeah so i'll I'll talk about publications and actually broaden this out into podcasts speaking at events any any kind of media really I think the main thing is positioning and trust. So, you know, let's say you're an investor who's got 
£100,000 to invest. And, you know, you've met Darren at the networking event who's got a couple of posts on Facebook, is relatively active on Instagram, but you don't know him. He's not really got much background experience that, that you can see publicly. And then, you know, you've got someone like yourself who they meet who's got their own podcast, being on other people's podcasts that have been featured in magazines to speak in at events that trust that you know you can see that person you can see that they're active clearly if they're in a magazine they've been vetted and they're active in the industry it just gives that extra layer um of kind of security to the investor to know that you are someone real incredible and i think that's probably the biggest benefit that's perhaps overlooked do you think that as well as, as trust, it's things like, um, I think you might have mentioned credibility and opportunities to also uh, demonstrate values such as integrity. Yes. Because I think that I've seen a number of people come into our industry that are a little bit like seagulls. They come in, <laughs> they flap around, make a lot of noise, squeal a lot, shit's everywhere. <laughs> and then before you know it, they've left. <laughs> and I think like being in this industry for quite a while, I can often see that. You see people coming yeah. in, making all this noise, all of a sudden they're like the hottest thing since sliced bread and then you don't hear anything. And then there are people that have just been there like pieces of the furniture, you know, just yeah. names that you that you recognize and, and that you trust and they haven't got a blemish on their their professional record. They've demonstrated obviously their integrity and transparency. Do you think that, you know, those sorts of values are important and does getting featured in publications enhance the ability to do that? It's in enhance your ability to kind of... I suppose to demonstrate it. Yeah, to demonstrate. I think the problem that you've got with like social media is people have got an extremely short attention span. So unless you're going to write an absolute novel on Facebook that no one's going to read, it's quite hard to articulate who you are. So you might look at things like video. If you're one of these people that makes a lot of noise, one of the things they have in common is they're very good at creating short on content that's snappy, that's captivating. If you can do that, that's helpful. But if you're not very technical, perhaps not. Whereas with magazines, you know, if you've got 1,400 words, that's a really good place to mm. showcase your personality, showcase your experience, showcase your values, really let people get to know you as a person. And I think there's something tangible about being in a physical magazine compared to just seeing a post on Facebook. Likewise with, with podcasts. When I write posts on Facebook, LinkedIn, whatever, you know, I'm trying to get a point across normally. So sometimes I can't really get who I am across within doing that. Whereas with a podcast, you know, you can hear my voice. We're talking about stuff that I'm doing, talking about Bluebrook to probably get a better feel of who I am. So I do think that these platforms are really good for giving investors or anyone just a kind of insight into who you are as a person. Um, I think something to add to that as well, and this is certainly something that we have experienced with the podcast. The podcast, believe it or not, is, is coming up for four years old in October, which is insane. And actually what you get is an incredible set of data. And what you see with podcasts certainly is how loyal the listenership is. You could almost guess sort of tens or the, at least sort of the nearest hundred, how many listeners you'll have month on month because you've got that much data because the audience comes back week in, week out. They're loyal and they're invested in what there is to discover, you know, in every episode. And I would imagine that with the way that magazines and subscriptions work, that that sort of readership is is similarly loyal. Is that the case, Sam? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, it's so nice when when the latest issue goes out that we're getting people tagging us in their stories, putting posts up, and that kind of thing. And it's to the point, yeah, you're right. You can kind of guess who's going to doing that and who your avid fans are. So you yep. do have some really powerful data, and we know who our readers are because we're doing surveys quite regularly. And because we run these events, we're actually shaking hands and meeting and having drinks with our readers too. Yeah. So we've got a good idea of our audience. And I think that's powerful because when you post to Facebook, you don't really know who's going to see it or if they're relevant. Exactly. Whereas with New Bricks, for example, we know exactly who's reading the magazine. That was exactly my point, really. The readership, and in our case, the listenership, um, yeah. they are, they're going out of their way. You know, They're making a concerted effort to go and spend some time, invest some of their precious time to read and learn and discover. And yeah. platforms like Instagram, and Facebook and YouTube, you know, it's very, very different. Like you said, the attention span is very short. We're often flicking on and off those sorts of things, um, you know, quickly, you know, between doing other things that are occupying us. YouTube it is very different itself to 
podcasts. Um, the, the listenership is nowhere near as loyal. Even platforms with tens of thousands of you know of, of subscribers doesn't necessarily mean those same people are coming back time yeah. after time and are potentially not quite as invested in what they will potentially pick up or learn in that video or, or resource or whatever it might be. Whereas when people are coming and going out of their way, way to subscribe to a magazine, sit down and read the magazine, that the intentions are often very different, I think. And, you know, I've been contacted a number of times when uh, after various magazine publications that I've done that, that people have obviously read something, they've found it interesting, it's resonated with them, and it's been really useful for that reason. So, yeah, I think publications are a very different type of media outlet and platform and channel that, that just have the scope for a very different type of opportunity that social media simply doesn't offer. Actually, I've got a really good example for you. I won't share any names, but I know somebody who has a huge social media following, maybe across the platforms, it's, it's, it's well into seven figures. And actually, it kind of happened by accident that they were you know, sharing stuff as, as a lot of people, investors do, but it, it sort of blew up almost by accident. It was picked up by something and then something else. And it, and it just sort of blew up and they kind of have ridden that wave ever since. But I remember having a conversation with this person and he said, look, it's great. We've got this incredible following and it's given us certain opportunities, but actually it, it's really not helped us with our original objective, which was to go out and raise finance and find people to potentially joint venture with. And it was because the audience that they curated was quite different to the audience that they needed to cur curate to potentially raise money from and do deals with. It was um, a much younger audience. And I think that there's something there as well. It's actually that avatar who's actually looking and reading the article in the magazine much more likely to be somebody who has, I mean, they've almost self-selected them as being suitable for whatever it is that you're doing. Whereas again, platforms and channels like Instagram and, and Facebook, it's not the same. We all see stuff that we look at, but we don't necessarily resonate or we certainly wouldn't. I share lots of stuff, but it's not because I'm that interested in it. It's because I'm sending it to people thinking, oh my God, look at this. But you know, do you agree, Sam? Like I think there's a number of things there. And actually, even though you're potentially not reaching millions of people in a publication, that small number of people could be so much more valuable than those potential millions of people on social media, right? 100%. I think another thing worth mentioning, and I know not all magazines follow this model, but the majority do, and definitely the ones in our sector. Um, the readers of the magazine are paid. They're, they're paying to subscribe to receive that magazine in the post. So you've got an audience that quite literally bought in, which means that they are interested in property, whereas on Instagram, I might follow a page like a fishing page because I find it therapeutic. Got no interest in going fishing. Um, you know, it, it's it's one of those. You might have people that are following you on Facebook because they're interested in what you do. Yeah. But they're never really going to get involved. Whereas if they're reading the magazine, they are bought into the property industry. There was one guy who featured. I'm going to try and remember to go off the top of my head. I think it was before I had the magazine. Someone saw him in Blue Bricks, if I remember correctly. And they were reading the magazine, they got in touch with him, and I think they ended up investing something like £425,000 in it. Now, well. I'm not saying that every feature in Blue Bricks is going to get that, um, but it's just an example of how that process can work in real time. Absolutely. So I think it's pretty clear, you and I are both in complete agreement that actually getting features in publications can be a great opportunity to both raise money, expand your network, you know, access other opportunities, and even just finding other cool people to sort of hang out next to and find inspiration and confidence and experience from. So I think all of that good stuff can absolutely come from magazines. And I do think for anyone who thinks that all of this stuff is just available freely on social media and it's of the same caliber, it's just, it's absolutely not. And I've, I've actually, despite how much I do on social media, I still remind people that <laughs> like, it's absolutely not. And I think you hit the nail on the head. When people are paying for a service, the value just tends to be that much higher. You're a publication, you've got to make profit, you have to invest, keep your readers happy. So you actually you do good covers, you feature good people, you do the background and the legwork, you display things in an interesting and, and informative and like um, interactive way. So yeah. very, very different prospect to social media. Let's talk then about how to get featured. 
you obviously, you know, you're the editor. You know how to do this. What is it? You know, why do some people get featured and others don't? And is there a recipe or almost a guidebook that you've got that we could share with our listeners to help them maybe, you know, grab the attention of people like yourself, Sam, get featured in these these publications? Okay, yeah. So I'm going to speak generally here. This isn't my perspective because I'll flip my perspective shortly. And this is a bit of pill to swallow and it's hard to say because it sounds off. But when you wrap your head around this, it becomes easier. No one cares about your story. And everyone's got a story that they think is interesting because your story is interesting to you and it, you know, it might be an interesting story. And the reason I say that is so many people approach magazines and not just magazines, publishers, hopes and any, anyone that's got a platform with, this is me, this is my story, it's all about me, me, me. And that's the wrong way around to do it. The best way to get in a magazine, on a podcast, to get on any kind of platform is to talk to the other person about what you can do for them and how you can help their listeners or their readers or their their viewers. Because that's, for me, as the editor of a magazine, the people that pay me are my subscribers and my advertisers. I want to please my readers. I want them to read the magazine and love the content and be actively engaged in it. So if you can approach me and tell me how me having you in the magazine is going to help my readers, I am very, very, very interested in having a conversation. If you can just approach and say, I think I've got an interesting story that I want to tell people, I'll probably hear you out because I'm me and I'm really interested in people. But most people will go, I'm not interested, I'm busy. So I think the key is to always think in the other person's interest. I'm nodding along because we get emails every single week. There's one in our entry, you know, at the minute it's Monday morning as we record this. Someone with, you know, what they think is an interesting story and they've sent some pictures over of a project and, and actually the story's really not that unique in any way. And actually the project is certainly not unique in any way. And it's not to say that everything that we want to feature has to be incredibly unique, yeah. but it very much screams, you know, I want to be on the show because it sort of benefit me and you're absolutely right we're always looking for ways to so for example you're on the show today because it's great for us to be able to share these insider tips with our you know uh, our listenership but also i'm pretty sure that you're going to pick up a lot of a lot of people who want to subscribe to the magazine and actually might be able to provide you some value and your readers value by potentially being featured and so on and so forth and actually, you're going to do a masterclass going into a lot more detail about how to actually make sure you get noticed and get featured, which, you know, so I completely get it. And, and I see it all the time. And actually, a lot of our guests will know this, but I'm constantly stalking people across all sorts of channels and not just channels. I got your magazine yesterday, Sam, that you sent, opened it up. And I'm looking through and I'm literally looking for people that we could potentially feature on our podcast. I'm looking for like those stories. I'm looking for people who've got something that, you know, is a good example of something. So even I am going through magazines because in a way that you've done a lot of hard work for me because I can get a bit of a head start on somebody's story. I can maybe find a slightly different or, you know, alternative angle for a podcast. Then actually, you know, there's really interesting scope there. So taking us back then, getting us to think differently about maybe how we approach the idea of this. It's not about our story. It's about actually what we can offer the readership, the, you know, the, yeah. the magazine. So, okay, take us a step further then, Sam. So let's say, you know, let's say actually that's how we're now starting to think about it and approach it. What do we do next? Okay, so what we do next is, if you can, try and find the editor. With, with me, people know I'm the editor of Blue Bricks. I'm, I put myself out there a lot, so it's quite easy. With other magazines and publications, it might be a bit difficult. So if you go to LinkedIn, find the company, type in editor, or, or you'll, you'll find them there. Um, or failing that, try and find someone in, in marketing or business development and send them a message, um, or send them an email if it's on the website. A lot of them will have the details on there or the web on the website. Or last resort, if you want, call them. You know, with me and Blue Bricks, we're always really approachable and always eager and keen to speak with people. Sometimes as well, it might be worth doing this if you have a service you want to push or a product, offer some money. Might be that the magazine doesn't take it because your story is interesting enough or valuable enough that they don't be paying. Um, but sometimes just that incentive of, because ultimately they are a business showing that you are willing to, to give and receive um, makes the company more receptive. 
Yeah. And um, so when people approach us, one of the things that I'll often do is I will have a look at their stuff. What I like on the show is I like people who are active and yeah. I can see are likely to share their episode. If we do an episode, are likely to share share it with their community and their network because obviously we then benefit from that as well. So I'll often look for some activity. I'll look, I'll, you know, I'll follow people's posts for, and I'll go back and look at what they've done. I'll do a search in the community and I'll see whether they've been engaging. Are they a valuable member of the community? Have they been offering experience and helping other people? You know, is can I see what they're about or actually... Is this just a, they've done one project, they just want to get featured and it's all about them. Would you guys do sort of similar things? Are you looking for a little bit of meat on that bone? Yeah, we are. So I've got a, a weakness and my market manager knows this. I really like people that help other people or try to help other people. And if I see that someone's active for charities or trying to help others, then I'm like, I'm a proper sucker for that one. Well, that, <laughs> that's just me. And in terms of acted, it, it's a strange one, you know. So yes, active in some ways uh, in terms of social media, but that can sometimes put me off because I found that sometimes the people at the most active uh, do the least. I'll give you a really good example, not of someone that's not active. I don't uh, want to get. Oh, sued. I was hoping we were going to get a juicy yeah. name then. <laughs> get, get a name. Drop, get the Sam, dro- Sam dropping bombs on the show. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll flip it. I'll do it the other way around. There's a, there's a guy that we that's on the front cover in that issue. A guy called Tom Sum. Now, Tom is such an interesting guy. He was on the Blue Bricks podcast. He was in the army in Iraq and Afghanistan. He then left the army, became a private security guard, and then saved that money to invest in property. And he's now doing ultra high end properties in Blackpool. He's got one with a cinema room inside it. Now, when I looked at Tom and White, he's not got much for a present. But then he actually invited me to the properties. He showed me around, told me his story. And he's an incredible guy. By the way, sorry to interrupt, but. I don't know whether you shared that on your stories or somewhere, but I saw whatever it was that you shared. This hasn't been in the magazine yet, so I, I don't think. Or was this in the magazine? Is this in the magazine? It's not just, yet. It's in no. an upcoming one. So you just shared a bit of your day with this individual, and I looked at that and I was like, "Wow, that's amazing!" So then I started to follow him. Yeah, unbelievable. Sorry to interrupt, but no, okay. No. <laughs> yeah, no, he's a great guy. Isn't he? I mean, if you look at his projects, um, some of the stuff to do is absolutely incredible uh, i think it's swish holiday apartments if anyone wants to check out instagram and um, but that's just an example of someone who actually when we looked online couldn't see much but then when we spoke to them there's quite a lot there so yeah sometimes the active thing is a big thing but i would say if you're someone that's quiet on social media don't let that put you off providing you've mm-hmm. got the credibility behind you that you can demonstrate that what you're saying is true that's the, the important part yeah, I agree. Do you know that one of the things that is like a real ick for me is those people who are too noisy on social media and it comes over, it's coming over as a little bit um, disingenuine. A lot of talk where you maybe can't see too much going yes. on behind the scenes. You know, I'm big on gut feelings. I get, a, I like that gut feeling of speaking to somebody for the first time. Do we click? Do I, do I feel like this person's honest, genuine, transparent? Do I think that they would be a good ambassador for for us and our brand? And I would never bring somebody on the show. And don't get me wrong, I've I've made one or two mistakes in the time where my gut has been wrong. But I like to know that actually they are a good fit for our brand. So people who are being in their own sort of vicinity, uh, overly silly, overly pushy, maybe a a little bit too sort of... uh, Sometimes it can almost come across as bragging. Um, I think there's a fine line of demonstrating your experience and and project success, but but also bragging. I think, you know, and and I'll often do a bit more due diligence. Also, I feel a bit of a hypocrite when I say this, but there's a lot of people out there who jump from doing one or two projects straight into property education, and that then becomes where a lot of the noise is about. And actually, as soon as I see that line being blurred, it is a bit of a put off as well. And and I have to think really carefully about whether that's kind of the right fit, because it just sometimes it's difficult and it's not black and white. But I like to feature property investors and understand where their focus is and things like that and actually not promote people to support a training course or something like that, unless we understand why we're doing it and and we might be perfectly fine to do that but that needs to be an agenda we're fully aware of so yeah just just for me i think i like to find really genuine and really authentic people sam and they don't have to have the most exclusive or unique anything yeah we need there's got to be something interesting there but i think for me those values of like integrity authenticity 
transparency are really, really important. But it's interesting to hear you talk about like that you look for similar things as well. Yeah, 100% because you can always work better with those people. And those are the people that are authentic and are trustworthy, that are like, we'll put them in a magazine, we'll also push the magazine and the fact that we've been in there into that. So it's always better to work with those people. Are you or anybody in your team, are you keeping an eye on other platforms or maybe things like podcasts, other publications? What's going on in social media? Are you looking for people and approaching people about maybe getting featured if you see something you think looks interesting? Or are you are you quite literally waiting for people to contact you? It's a bit of both, to be honest. So Tom Hill just spoke about approached us. We, we have some people in there that approach us. Other people are, are just people. I've kind of met along the way. If we see someone on social media who's doing something interesting, then we might reach out and go, hey, what's that we're doing? It's really interesting. Let's have a chat. So it's a, it's a bit of both. Some people email in. Sometimes we approach people. Other times it happens organically by just kind of bumping into people at events and building a relationship out from there. Yeah. It's really interesting because I think a lot of people who were listening to today's episode probably thought that ending up in a publication or something like that really just happened because you shared pictures of something on social media. Yeah. And actually, you know, you either got featured or you didn't. And actually what you're saying is quite different, taking a much more proactive approach, which makes perfect sense because that's often you know, what you need to do in business if you want to get the results. You've actually got to get up, kind of try and make it happen, but do it do it in the right way and make it a bit of a win-win for everybody, which of course is where all of the best type of business deals are struck. And and, and this is exactly what you're saying to us. Yeah, it's true. And you know, what? When I, when I do public speaking, it's something that I try and explain to people. It's like, please email us if you have something you want to share or... If you think there's something that might be interesting, then email. I mean, at the end of the day, the worst thing we're going to say is it's not right for the magazine, but it's definitely going to be a harsh thing. Some of the really interesting features we've had, like Tom, are people that approached us. So by all means, uh, email magazines, email podcast folks, make sure you get in touch with them. Sometimes you will get scouted, but if you sit around waiting forever, there's going to be a lot of luck involved in that. So I might not be your friend on Facebook. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay. So you've shared some really useful insights today and um, some good tips as how to actually sort of think about getting getting featured. I suppose then sort of just to summarize this advice, this can be really great to expand your network, raise private finance, find more deals and opportunities. And there's a number of ways to potentially get featured, but don't be afraid of going direct. Just think a bit more about what's in it for you. And look, what I would say is to anyone who is able to get featured, that one feature can lead to so many other things. Like I said, that could lead to me just happening to notice something in there and a podcaster like me then saying, oh, can we feature you on the show? Can we do something? And honestly, I genuinely think that all of the stuff I do now really is the byproduct of what I did before that. And now we get approached quite a lot to do various things. But I think a lot of it comes from the time and the effort and the work and the commitment that I made to try to do all of that stuff in the earlier stages when actually I wasn't particularly known and we didn't have a podcast and we didn't have a community of 10,000 people. So it has been incredibly valuable for me. And honestly, I would account a lot of the opportunities that I've been really fortunate enough to access over the years to a lot of the opportunities I had to feature in publications and and actually get my name and story and brand out there. So from a personal position, I think there is so much value in any of our investors listening to the show today in going out of the way to make sure that they try and get something like this done for themselves because it can just it can be an absolutely wonderful thing for one's business. And I was going to add one final thing as well, that it's just consistency. Like, you know, don't think you're going to go on one podcast and that's it, you'll be famous. I think it's about just being on the present, being consistent, trying to get kind of where you can everywhere you can so that more and more people see you because different platforms have different followings too absolutely and you know that that is one of the hardest bits is being consistent yeah. it's really easy to sort of muster a bit of energy you know um yeah, for a couple of days or a week and get something together but actually doing it consistently that's when one opportunity turns into another then you find another door opens and so on and so forth so a great bit of advice and actually that advice is not exclusive to, to getting featured in publications or on podcasts or anything like that actually i think that that is just a something that we have to be doing in business if we want to succeed i'm sure everything that you do you know 
at Blue Brick Sam is exactly the same. I was saying it's been an absolute pleasure to have you in the show. It's been great to get a bit of an insider's approach to, to how the, our investors and listeners can get featured themselves. As I mentioned earlier, you are very kindly going to do a full masterclass on this and share your advice and experience in even more detail. So our listeners can keep an eye out for that inside the HMO roadmap coming soon. Sam, just remind us where... For anyone listening today who's thinking, you know what, I think there's something that I could do with Sam. I think I've got something that would would be great that they and their listeners would really benefit from. How best to contact you? Okay, yeah, best way to contact me is email. So hi at leobricksmagazine.com and email that email and myself or the team will pick it up. If you've got some inquiry that you want to feature in the magazine, you know, get in touch, let us know. Uh, you know, say that you've listened to this podcast, happy to have a conversation with anybody. Don't let imposter syndrome get in the way. Secondly, Instagram, Blue Bricks Magazine. Or for me, the, the place that I'm probably most active personally is LinkedIn, which is just my name, Sam Cook. There is a soul singer called Sam Cook. I'm not a singer. You will be able to differentiate this both quite <laughs> easily. And if you're interested in Blue Bricks, if you go to bluebricksmagazine.com, we do a free month trial. So you can click join, it won't cost you a penny, get a magazine posted to your door. If you enjoy it, great guns, stay subscribed. If not, we won't be offended, but we will never speak to you ever again. <laughs> Absolute no-brainer. Can't yeah. say fairer than that. And Pigeons of Property. Let's oh, tell, tell the guys about Pigeons of Property. Because I don't often come out of my uh, you know, own little bubble, and I am coming out for Pigeons and Property. I'm, I'm really glad you're speaking of that. Thank you. Yeah, so Pigeons and Property, uh, I'm really proud of the name, is a networking event where we're going to be doing laser play pigeon shooting and we're going to have some speakers. So we've got yourself, Andy, who's talking about obviously your experience in property and, and building a, a company that you can sell. We've got Hayley Andrews from Copper Elevator speaking and we've got Nick Thorpe speaking as well. So three really experienced people that have yep. been taken to Great the stage. Up. The point is, your food's included, your drinks included, and it is networking, but it's just going to be fun. By having an experience of people, laughing people, making memories of people, you just build better relationships than you do sat at a table with a pint going, so how many HMOs do you have? So it's going to be a really fun day. So if you go to bluebricksmagazine.com on the homepage, there's pigeons and property. We've got an early bird deal at the moment, £150, and that includes your food, drink, uh, the, the laser clays itself, all your speakers, and everything. <laughs> And of course, you get to hang out with me and Sam. Well, yeah, with you, Andy. Which are you giving out autographs on today? <laughs> I'll have a gun in my hand, so just be careful. <laughs> Sam, thank you for uh, for joining me on the show today. It's been an absolute pleasure. I always love our cat shops. Wish you and Blue Bricks best of luck into the future. But it's great to see what you've done with the magazine and how successful and how popular you and the magazine have become and look before we sign off i think i just need to warn you i think your inbox is going to be full by the time <laughs> this episode no honestly really appreciate it thanks for everything you do and look forward to catching up with you soon my pleasure thank you so much Andy.